yesterday was Monday. And you know what Monday is? It's great. Monday every week is great because I don't have to go to an office and be stressed about whatever stress I was being about. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Promote the Hell Out of It. My name is Ms. Trujillo and this is the show where I talk to experts worth promoting about subjects we should all be talking about. And this is an episode that is very special to me personally. I talk to Faris Jacob, co-founder of the nomadic creative consultancy Genius Steals. Now Faris and his wife and partner Rosie are nomads, which allows them to travel wherever clients need them and to be inspired by their travels in between and this is something that myself and my partner have been doing for the past three years too and that we are very much enjoying so I was obviously excited about what I could learn from Faris and his experience. Faris is also the author of the book Paid Attention Innovative Advertising for a Digital World. He was named one of the 10 modern day madmen by Fast Company, one of the most respected planners in the world in the planning survey and he has had so much experience within the world of advertising. He's been a founding partner of a digital agency in New York City, the chief innovation officer of an advertising holding company, chief digital officer at the flagship office of the world's largest advertising agency. He has won and judged numerous advertising awards, and he is a keynote speaker. Obviously, so much that I could learn from this conversation, and hopefully you all enjoy it as much as I did, because it is one of the conversations that is going to stick in my mind for a very long time. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Faris Jacob. So Faris, it is absolutely wonderful to have you on the podcast. How are you doing? Thanks, I'm really well. It's nice to be here. I am really excited to chat about what you're doing with Genius Steals. To start off with, can you give us a brief rundown of what it is you actually provide? Well, Genius Steals is a creative consultancy that happens to be nomadic. So my wife and I have no fixed location. And as part of that, it makes us quite flexible to travel from client to client and spend uh, variable amounts of time with them. We provide, I guess, a number of different consulting products. So we do a lot of public speaking. We do a lot of keynotes at conferences and at sort of big brand uh, marketing days and innovation days and whatnot. We do a lot of uh, bespoke training and workshop stuff, which is often in the area of working with clients on how they manage their agencies and the process thereof, and then working with agencies on how they, uh, uh, for example, broaden their outputs or, or, or narrow it, depending on the brief in a way. So we've helped media agencies develop creative products. We've helped creative agencies expand their process out of a default to kind of 30 second spot advertising to larger experience kind of uh, ideas because they've been bought by companies that do experiences, for example. Yeah. Um, and then we do longer term, although not very many, we do longer term consulting projects, which are usually no more than two or three a year. They normally are done in sprints on location at the agency or the client in question. And we will sort of develop a brand and business strategy that we think will future-proof them regardless of what they uh, they thought they did before uh, for what we think is coming into this sort of whole media, marketing, creative uh, landscape as it changes nowadays. Absolutely, and it's ever-changing, definitely. One of the things I wanted to touch on, first of all, are the brands you've worked on. The ones that stood out for me, I'm a music fan, so Gibson was, I, I love Gibson. Uh, I have also worked with The Guardian before. I was an event manager for them once, and they were wonderful. Uh, and Google I've worked with as well. Um, but has there been any of those brands that have been the most memorable for you personally? So these are all brands we've worked with since starting our own company, although some we've worked with previously when we were agency before. Um, Gibson was fascinating just because um, they have such a strong brand in a particular category. And they were looking to rebuild their entire marketing function sort of with a blank slate. So that was a really interesting project for us because it took us back into, I guess, change management and team construction and inside-outside consulting, which agencies very very rarely get to do, I think. Like when I was an agency person, I was doing a lot of building teams, building products or trying to work out what agencies could sell now, you know, be it social or content or whatever was relevant at the end of the last decade. Um, 
and taking so I, but I started out in management consulting before I got into advertising 20 years ago so I have some muscle memory of the kind of that approach to solutions solutions that require you to hire and fire etc so that was really interesting and and the brand is iconic I think probably our most um our biggest and most repeat business is, is Coca-Cola and there's such a big company that every project is very different that would just it's just really interesting for us because it, it can be from um, thinking about how they manage uh, social and content across 50 markets and 12 hubs or hosting events for their uh, their customers which is really fun as well there's a couple of things you mentioned that I love because are integral to to what I talk about on the podcast and one of them is is future proofing brands which I think is something that that is is so important to the way people view their strategy and often is overlooked in terms of short term short term benefits it's it's really interesting and it must be super interesting trying to implement something like future thinking with a brand like coca-cola yeah because it's it's a brand that's got so much heritage how do you come about mm -hmm. making sure that that what they're doing is future proof i mean that that particular engagement is really interesting for me because um 15 or so years ago i helped write the, the sort of planning process that coke adopted from naked um and they they then hired my old boss to be the head of comms at coke this is he's left since it's years ago now but uh, we were involved in this sort of this whole process over several generations so seeing literally 15 years ago sort of an approach to comms seeing how it sort of moved itself towards an approach to content because content became very salient in around kind of 2010 uh, everybody was very excited about it and thought that would be the kind of uh, the future of everything that we did and and then seeing kind of the the sort of inevitable backlash against social and content and sort of working out how to then reassimilate that stuff back into a system that was built around making content was super, super interesting. No, I mean, future proofing is hard, obviously. It, it requires, like all strategy, making bets, essentially. Uh, making making informed bets, ideally. <laughs> That's the strategy part. But regardless, you're, you're betting on a future state, and then you've got to work out what future state you want and what you think your competitors are doing and what you think the market will do in three to five, let's say. Um, none of which is simple. And when it comes to, to talking to a company like Coca-Cola, are the stakes bigger for you personally? Like you're talking about betting on something. Does it become suddenly that much bigger of a bet when you're talking to a brand like that? Or do you try and view it in the same way as you would anyone else? It's a good question. I think in purely management bureaucratic terms, working with a large global brand, regardless if it's Nestle or Coca-Cola or whatever, comes with scale conditions that are unusual for a business of our size generally i would say so yes there are definitely scale conditions that are unusual however i think after a couple of decades in the business so you know when you're a, when you're a young ad person right and you're like i just want to work on really cool brands you know and like whatever generation you grew up in there'll be a different set of really cool brands google or nike or sort of or apple are kind of default very obvious you know, answers to that right Turns out, like, I've worked with most of those brands, right? I've worked with Nike, I've worked with Google. They're fine. They're great. They're all good clients. All, it, all challenges are essentially are the same. There are no cool brands and uncool brands. If you are a practitioner, there's, like, there are no good um, illnesses. There's just things you have to try and solve if you're a doctor. There's not, like, oh, I'm really excited about this particular kind of illness. It's like, no. That, <laughs> they're, just, they're just things to think about. And so, yes, we try and treat them all big, small, uh, the same. Such a wonderful way to view it. And I think it's something really difficult to get to that level of thinking of things. I was talking to a, a promoter who works with some really big bands recently, and he says that the, there's still a few people that he'd get starstruck around. So being able to actually give advice to people, but taking aside their heritage must be incredibly difficult. I think it's easier than being starstruck with celebrities just because there's less invested in the individual. Like working with a corporation over any period of time, you'll work with lots of different people. That's just how corporate life works. Tenure is not particularly long for most of the marketing functions that you know exist in either agency or, or, or client. So individuals move through the system relatively rapidly, right? Whereas meeting celebrities is difficult because their brand is themselves and therefore there's a weird 
so yeah when you meet somebody famous it's strange because you, you know they're famous and you know they know they're famous and there's this whole weird like refraction thing that happens it's impossible to sort of be normal around really famous people but yeah with brands no matter how cool the agency no matter how cool the client it's just people like us doing jobs and, that, and that's fine has that actually helped in terms of making the transfer over to a nomadic lifestyle the fact that so many people go through the brand and you're dealing with individuals has it made it easier to make a, a transfer over to a nomadic lifestyle? Yeah, partially, yes. So people often ask, how, does we, how do we do what we do? And it's a complex, layered question. But the, the beginning thing is to think about is, is deal flow, right? People want to have to employ you. And so when, you, when you're you know, starting out, when we have very young uh, strategists or creative saying, I'd like to do what you do, I'm like, that's super, it's cool. But it'll be a lot harder for you because you haven't got two decades of working all over the world um, to rely on with people that you know already, right? And so in that sense, yes, because people move so frequently in, in, in the industry. Lots of my former colleagues and our clients, lots of former clients and our colleagues, and many have ended up being clients or partners in some uh, fashion since we started our business. So definitely, definitely in that sense, yes, because it's sort of people who, who individually know you individually or me and Rosie individually and know what we can do and aren't looking for the kind of cover your ass of what well, they used to say, you know, you never get fired for hiring IBM kind of thing, right? It, it, the big agencies have scale and stature, but we don't do that kind of work, really. We don't compete with them. We, we would like to work with them. It's, it's usually a lot of fun for us because we're not a massive infrastructure business. So it, you, you tend to know what you're getting when you choose us. Um, but yeah, that is true. And people move around a lot. One of the really weird peccadillos of our industry is that if you speak English, especially with an English accent, you can sort of work in our industry in any country in the world, which is odd. It's really odd. Like it's extremely strange. You can go and be a planner in Japan or China and not speak Japanese or Chinese. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it is very, it's, it's very weird to me, but it's a thing. And it's a, it's a sort of a gift that we get. It's like a post-colonial gift of some kind. So you're like, well, there's a lot of us around, basically. So, yes, it is very helpful. <laughs> Definitely. In terms of nomadic lifestyle at the moment, it's it's a word that goes around a lot. Myself and my partner have been nomadic for the past three years, roughly. But I do like to talk to people about the reality of it. Uh, because it is a buzzword so it seems like it's all go it's all good but from your perspective what is the reality of nomadic lifestyle this is a great question because it's a, it's a particular area of um interest to m myself and rosie which is that people have a tendency to fetishize and pigeonhole based on things that they sort of understand and you know if you're working every day and it's winter and you're going to an office the idea of being on a beach seems inherently <laughs> like just you know, amazing, right? But beaches are deeply impractical places to work. Yes. <laughs> it's, the sand is very annoying and the Wi-Fi is not good. And so, like, showing the sort of reality of what we do, I think, is definitely a, a thing that we try and communicate to people that, like, seem to think we're on vacation constantly. It's like, well, well, no, we're trying to run a business. That business has to pay for us to live. That's kind of how that works. And at the same time, we have to sort of manage the logistics of being in a large number of countries over the course of several months, let's say. So, as you know, being nomadic, right, the job of living takes up like a full-time job, essentially. As I always say to people, like, it sounds, it sounds glamorous and idyllic, right? But do you like making decisions? Because most people do not like making decisions. Most people do not enjoy the cognitive burden of choices that don't have a clear, better option, right? And <laughs> so it, it, if you have a job and an apartment with a lease, you make a decision, let's say once a year, roughly, and then that decision is made. Not every two weeks, you yeah. You, exactly, yeah. you never have to think about where am I gonna sleep again tonight if you don't want to. You can choose to sleep somewhere else, but you have a default. But every two weeks or so, yeah, or every week even, you're doing this, you have to rebuild that whole thing. It's just a massive cognitive burden. Um, we have an assistant, lovely Ashley, she's amazing. She's also a nomadic, so she understands the ins and outs of it. And she's extremely, extremely good. Um, that's why I'm on the school, because she told me to be on the school, because um, she's amazing. But um, it is a full-time full -time gig, yeah. So that part of it, I think, is difficult. I think people um, 
tend to fetishize escape things and, and anywhere that seems glamorous and sunsetty feels escapey from a sort of corporate office environment. Um, but there are lots of, I mean, and not to be too negative about it, like it's much more fun than having a job and, and living in the same place. I would say that just as a default, that is true from my point of view. Otherwise, I wouldn't keep doing it. I prefer this than, um, and it's taken us a few years to make it work. Like we're six years in now, we've started to sort of know how we do this. Uh, and, and manage it. But um, you have to get very good at making friends extremely quickly. Um, otherwise, you're just on your own the whole time and nobody needs to spend that much time with me. It, it would drive <laughs> you insane. Like, it's deep. I'm extremely annoying. Even an hour. I can relate even to that. Even the hour, you'll be like, by the end of it, you'll wish it had stopped. <laughs> you, really, like, you, you and your partner are constantly together. And so it's sort of like being on tour with a band, not in a glamorous way, just that everything you experience, you experience at the same time. And so you can't talk about it at the end of the day because you are both there always. It's you know? so true. And in fact, I, I play in a band. And one of the things we had to do with people in the van is be really upfront and say, look, if you want to tell people, look, I'm out, I'm putting my headphones in, I don't want to listen to anyone for a while, you need to be open to say that. Because you're with everyone all the time, all the time time is is difficult yeah exactly but as you said i don't want to make this all doom and gloom because there are positives to to being <laughs> nomadic so yes let's twist it what are your top your top positive highlights of being able to relocate i mean so that there's probably five i mean three to five definite things that i think about all the time one which is today is what tuesday right yeah but yesterday was monday and you know what monday is it's great Monday every week is great because I don't have to go to an office and be stressed about whatever stress I was being about, right? I have to do my job and get my things done and, you know, make money to survive. But Mondays can be anywhere and I can choose to spend them how I choose. And that freedom, the flexibility of that is utterly intoxicating. It's, it's just, it comes with massive costs. We've discussed the costs already, right? The cost of risk of not knowing if you're going to make any money this month or this year, that's challenging. But the freedom that any Monday I can be anywhere and no one can tell me not to be That's is intoxicating. Yeah. The, the lack of boredom that comes as a corollary of that, every time you go to a new country, you realize you're stupid. And that's such a great feeling. Just knowing that what you know is, is nothing. arbitrary <laughs> and a set of norms that mean nothing to people in this country. And it's great. It just suddenly makes you realize that it, there's no normal, there's no <laughs> foreign. There's <laughs> just what you've seen before and what you haven't. And that just is everything to me. Like travel is very important to us. Um, and Rosie's very good because she's American and generally bold and charming at talking to strangers in a way that I haven't been historically because I'm English and much more introverted. Um, but it's, it's just great. It really is. So that, that's really important. Freedom and novelty is huge. Like having a constant stream of reinforcement that people, while seeming to be the worst on account of the kind of geopolitical news <laughs> storm that we live in, everyone you meet is nice. Like without any exceptions, we've, well, maybe one exception in five years, everyone we've met has been helpful, charming, pleasant, kind, and a number of them become friends and we end up trying to go on vacation with them later, be them clients or randoms, you know, which is, it's just really nice to remind yourself that. Definitely, yeah. And uh, ideally, if you can make it work, it's not always possible. As Rosie says, we don't get to decide where we're going or when we go, but we get to go to a lot of cool places. But if you can follow the weather, it makes a big difference. <laughs> I, I wanted to touch on a, a couple of things you've mentioned so far, because I think we've got a, a pretty good analysis of, of the pros and cons of being nomadic. But one of the things you mentioned as a con is your your friendships it can be difficult to to keep them going you're you're meeting new people constantly but to try and turn that into into a pro how have you learned to to make and keep good friendships and not make them superficial so it's a huge it's actually a really big thing that we think about a lot um so to begin with it seemed really fun you just go around and travel and visit your friends and you have friends in all these countries and it's and you meet new friends and you get good at making friends fast you sort of learn to pass people's values pretty quickly um but one of the things we found lacking in the first couple of years that we began to miss was an idea i guess we call community which is not that we didn't have a number of friends but they didn't know each other and we never hung out together as a group so we had our wedding super fun lots of our friends met each other for the first time transatlantically 
they all started hanging out and we just were sort of somewhere in Asia, you know, going, oh, they seem to be having fun. And we got really jealous kind of like of this community feeling. So we have worked really hard on that, especially Rosie does. We put on two events a year, usually about 30 people. The, the brief is normally 15 people we've met that year and 15 people that we have already met who are invited. And uh, either they come to Mexico or to this mountain house we have in Tennessee. And we make them cook together and hang out and play games and become friends with each other because it's just necessary for us that they all are friends. And so we have to do a lot of logistical work to make that possible. So that's definitely part of it. I'm extremely, I don't know, how old are you, sir? I'm 30. Okay, great. It's great. So is a great year. <laughs> I'm 41. And I have noticed that um, men especially, and not to gender stereotype, blah, 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 but just, you know, generally, I'd say that men I know as we age become less and less comfortable with interpersonal communication. We tend to not keep up. I, I got off Facebook a while ago. I tweet all the time, but it's kind of very broadcasty, not very intimate, you know? And I don't speak to my friends very often. And so a lot, I think a lot of husbands find that their wives become a uh, de facto support for their social life because their wives, women tend to be more good at or more comfortable in maintaining uh, longer interpersonal relationships over time in groups and otherwise, right? So yeah, we, I've You're been working on that. You're making me feel so bad about how I treat Jane now but I don't talk, yeah but I do we I think we all do this mate like I, I don't think it's so there's a thing that's called transactional memory and transactional relationships so like there's a lot of talk around how women do a lot of emotional labor like hidden shadow work in relationships be it looking after kids is the most obvious but you know lots of logistics and arranging things part of it is also social life support and you definitely see it with aging men who are suddenly divorced for example and they just don't know anybody suddenly they just they didn't realize how dependent they had become you know so anyway i i this this last year or so i've been definitely trying to make more, more phone calls probably too much of my social life apparently exists on podcasts which probably isn't super healthy but um but regardless you know <laughs> it's still nice um and, and just sort of trying to be, be more um active at that myself i guess that that really hits home with me because I'm pretty sure most of my social life is through the podcast at the moment which uh, isn't great but is very suited to moving around every week or two yes yeah we've talked a lot about how this affects individuals if they are nomadic but in terms of of companies looking to hire people why should they look at nomadic workers as as a bonus as something that they should actually seek Okay, so that's an interesting set of questions, I would say. One which is kind of at a base level. Uh, you're English, right? Well, no, I'm, I'm actually from the Canary Islands. Oh, okay, cool. Do you know where they're named Canary Islands? Yeah, the canines, the dogs. Yeah, the dogs, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the bird is named after the island, the island is named after the dogs. Yeah, good. Yeah. Um, that's a fun one. I like that one. So, okay, so Europe, you're European, you can work in Europe. That's good. American working culture is very strange. When I moved to America, um, because of the scale of companies there, so let's say I went from an agency of 30 to an agency of 2,000 people okay, when I was yeah. at one big ad agency, in one building, one skyscraper, all working at the same company, nominally at least. The scale of that is hard to communicate to or interoperate with in any realistic way right so one of the things that happens in, in my observations of American companies especially that I think has begun to infect other parts of the world is presentism as a sort of deflection of productivity which by which I mean if you're always at your desk or always seem to be at your desk or you're always the jackets on your chair and the light is on and stuff people assume you're busy and if you're assumed to be busy people tend to fire you less essentially I think is what happens and in America, because you don't have severance protection, right? So it's employment at will in most states. So you can be let go that day for no cause with no more than two weeks severance, which is like two weeks is not enough to pay rent, right? So that's a, a constant sort of state of fear, which is mitigated by a constant presence. So I guess to get to the no my point, my point being is to get, in order to understand how to work with people remotely, you have to get over the idea that their presence is somehow a proxy for them being useful. Whereas in big corporations, if you're managing a lot of people, you're like, I don't know, I do what anyone does. I try to keep track of it, but that dude and that woman are always here, so they're probably busy. It's just a simple heuristic, which is extremely toxic and dangerous in terms of what it creates as a behavior in, in the company. So the first bit is, yeah, trusting people to act like adults requires you to trust them and let them act like adults. That's part of it. Um, are there kind of specific nomadic, not just remote benefits? I would say yes. 
I think the cost of logistics. So once in a while, you know, our assistant or us will be out of pocket for a day or two days because we're flying. So that comes with obviously a, a logistic and availability cost. On the upside, do we get to see interesting stuff everywhere? Well, yeah, of course. Are we visiting agencies and clients all over the world? Well, not all over, but lots of places. And are they mostly really friendly and just want to show us what cool stuff they're up to? Yeah, mostly they are. For example, we do some stuff with global brands on occasion. And if you're working on a global brand, like I will just come back from a few months of travel with every ad I've seen in every market for that company. <laughs> and be like, so the translation here yeah, exactly. doesn't actually yeah. mean, doesn't, I looked into it, the translation in Ethiopian doesn't mean exactly what you think it means or whatever. And they're like, no, we know that. And I was like, isn't that interesting though? And they're like, you're such a geek. And I'm like, no, I know. But yeah, so that, I think that is very valuable. I think particularly what we do is very visible and culturally determined and nuanced. And so getting a feel for other cultures um, definitely helps, I would say. Plus just basic level research, you know, you, you, people doing groups across 12 markets. So yeah, we could do that for you. We can just literally <laughs> this year have a chat with 10 people while we're traveling and we've sort of done the same thing for no money. So that's good. And then there's the whole side of the mental health yeah. of nomadic workers mm -hmm. because you're able to see these things because you're you're able to to be in a different state of mind to your point which is mental health is a real problem for lots of people especially in highly time intensive professional services industries that are predicated on a lot of subjectivity and so advertising being a particularly difficult case i would say right like lawyers and bankers have their trouble no doubt obviously they do there's some degree of objectivity in the in the in the system that they have to play in, whereas advertising is so subjective that like we reach out for and grasp learnings because we don't necessarily have a lot of them. A lot of people's sick days aren't really sick days; they just need a day, and sometimes you just need a day to do laundry. To be honest, like working in New York, no one does that because laundry is delivered, right? <laughs> like. Everything in New York works around the idea that you're not going to have any time to do anything apart from work. So food is delivered every hour of the day, laundry is delivered, everything is delivered because that's how you're assumed to live and it's not a healthy way to live. I think the flexibility portion is very important. So if I can work very intensively for a month and then take a week off, like this week, pretty light. I may probably just decide to not look at email for the next couple of days, who knows. And that's, it's that freedom to, to be able to, you know, recover when you need to, that's very helpful. We've done a few of these projects. Managing remote teams like this is complex. It takes really amazing project managers and people because if you're putting together a multi-person creative build, be it digital or otherwise, you need a lot of people and you need to organize them. You begin to really understand how valuable producers are and how extraordinarily important they are in the agency system because they basically make magic happen out of nothing, which is just genuinely incredible. But doing it over remote is hard, right? So for example, I was thinking this this morning. So our newsletter, our newsletter goes out twice a week, right? Our newsletter is quite short, designed to be a little pithy, a little inbox inspiration, you know. Uh, and we have a guest editor or curator. It was once a month, we're gonna go to once a week, I think, or at least once every two weeks, because there's a lot of demand, which is really nice. You wanna be involved. Um, it's, a, it's a nice, happy space, people feel like, I think, our newsletter. Strands of genius. I will obviously link to it. Yeah, no, absolutely. But so Rosie, this is Rosie's project. She came up with the idea. She's managed it through with Ashley as well, managing all the contributors. So like imagine 50 different contributors in a year, right? 50. Okay. It's just an email newsletter. It's not a high paid product, right? It's a letter. But to manage 50 contributors over the course of a year, it means that every email comes with like 10 emails around that email just to get it done. To say, okay, they said yes, okay, here's a slot for you, okay, here's some blah, blah, blah. What do you wanna write about? Can you send us the thing? Here's the preview. Every single one is 10 emails. That's 500 emails just to have a guest contributor in our newsletter. Then to sort of factor that up to building something complex, it's a great deal of email, basically. It's very similar to the sort of shadow work that I was talking about in relationships. Great producers often are, are women who just get things done in agencies and they move around the obnoxious egos of the, of the men <laughs> just to get things done because like it's so much work that you just don't see because it's emails. But this is the thing, there's, there's an absolutely beautiful quote in, in your press release by uh, Kurt Vonnegut. And I'm probably pronouncing that completely wrong. I mean, Vonnegut, I think, but it's fine. Yeah, Vonnegut, there we go. 
use the time of a total stranger in such a way that he or she will not feel the time was wasted. That is is so beautiful and relates to to both the nomadic lifestyle, the remote working that we're talking about, but also the way both sides, the the companies and the workers deal with each other. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that that you've implemented that or best implemented trying to streamline communication? So um, Rosie and Ashley have a number of different processes, but we have a little thing in our blurb which says if you need regular check-ins and calls, if you need a big account management function to hold your hand to this process, you probably do not want to hire us because we don't, we don't do that and we're not going to do that. Like we will take a brief, we'll have the meetings, we'll have the calls and we'll deliver something and then it'll be delivered. <laughs> and then we can talk about it. We're not going to check in every three days and go through a status sheet. That's just not how it's going to work. How conceptual should we get here? Extremely conceptual. Let's do it. Okay. All right. So the nature of the firm, right? So I think his name was Coetzee. Uh, Ronald Coase. Ronald Coase wrote the book, The Nature of the Firm in 1937. And um, what it talks about is why do companies exist? What is the point of a company? Like, why economically do you think that companies came about? Like, what's good about them? What makes them better at not at producing economically efficient products? And, and his idea is, it's transaction costs. So what he says is, essentially, companies, by incorporating a single body, by doing so, they mitigate transaction costs. So in order to make an ad, let's say, I have to go and find a client that wants to buy an ad. I have to come up with ideas for an ad. I have to find people that make ads all that sort of stuff. And to put them together each time in a sort of Hollywood production model is extremely expensive in time and cost, right? It's hard. You need a lot of institutional knowledge, a big Rolodex, but also it just takes time and requires you to have availability and all that sort of stuff, right? So these are transaction costs. So companies exist to mitigate those, to, to avoid making too many of them, right? But something that happens, I believe, when companies are too big and too old is that you spend more time doing bureaucracy than you do doing the thing you think you do for work. So at a certain point, you spend more than half your effort managing the system you exist inside by having more meetings and sending more slacks and whatever it is that you've got to do to communicate internally. And once that happens, the company is now trying to maintain its own existence rather than solve the problem it was nominally in place to solve. That's some variant of what Clay Shirky once said that Kevin Kelly then made into the Shirky principle, which is that companies will defend the problem they are a solution to, even if that problem is no longer really a problem. Yeah, yeah of sense. course. So we try and avoid, we try and avoid uh, unnecessary communication. That said, it's sort of easy. So Rosie and I uh, are, are together, as we sort of said before, 24-7, right? So we're never not on the clock or off the clock. So we're working on a project, let's say, and then we're like, and we do a lot of work in this sort of creativity area, which says it's really important. Work really hard for a bit, then take a few hours off. Go for the incubation period, go for the shower, go for the bath, go for the whatever, right? Let your brain relax and let it do its, let it do its job. And so we're, we're, we're quite lucky that we'll go have dinner, try not to talk about the project, and then like an hour into dinner, suddenly we're like, oh, you know what would be cool though? And then it sort of just happens naturally. We don't need to, yeah, we don't need to, it just goes. Yeah. We don't need to slack it because we're already there with the person we're working with so how, how do you make sure that you're able to switch off because that's extremely difficult when you're working remotely you're always generally on the go and obviously having an assistant helps there's there's lots of things you can put in place but it doesn't mean you're you're off the clock how do you switch off so um it's variable you, you are exactly right right you could always be working there's always more stuff you could be doing, trying to get new clients, building new IP, creating more content. I found that as I got older, I don't like working in the evenings anymore. I used to love my all-nighters. They were very fun. You get a bit of free time. It's quiet. I no longer have the appetite or the energy for all-nighters, and I prefer not to work after sunset, regardless of when that is. So that, for me, is important. Rosie will still work off sunset, but I, I made a sort of... I drew a line in the sand. I said, look happy to get things done and if it's a crunch yes we'll probably do something late but if I can avoid it it'll be better for my mental health if I don't have to do things when I'm cranky and stuff but switching off is generally quite hard for, for all of us I think that have kind of very loud interior monologues and I think our industry is particularly rife with these sort of introspective people that have 
quite a lot of a tendency to ruminate and a desire to constantly be stimulated. So, I mean, I think about my media consumption a lot. One of the cool things about the nomadic thing, as I'm sure you know, is that every week or two weeks, you can set, set up a whole new set of habits. Like habits change based on context really easily. It's far more malleable to change your exercise regime or your TV watching, whatever it is, if you are constantly in different places. And often we don't have access to full band Wi-Fi or media. So then we have big book periods or you know, gaming periods or TV periods. I think a lot about how I manage my media intake to try and sort of optimize my brain. Not in a productivity way, to be honest, not like everything. So I was tweeting this thing yesterday. There's a nice guy called Jamie Bartlett who I met recently. He wrote this book called The People Vs. Tech. And um, I was tweeting this HBR article, which is like, the reason you should do nothing is because it impre- increases your productivity. It's like, can I just do nothing and not do it to increase productivity? Can I just do nothing for the sake of doing nothing? And I was like, exactly, yes. That's the, that's the thing we're trying to work on, isn't it? I find it really interesting that that we're constantly trying to find the best use for our time and that oh, includes our off I hate time. productivity so much, yo. The amount of times I'm like, right, I'm going to chill out, I'll put YouTube on, and then I'm trying to find the most productive videos to watch during yeah, that exactly. time. You're indexing, you're, you're how-toing, you're self-improving, you're like, oh, this inspiration is really interesting for this. I know, it's weird, but like, part of it is good. It's, it's the pattern recognition engines that our brains are. And those of us in our business, particularly, I guess, more tuned to pattern recognition and cataloging and stuff. But it does lead you towards sort of, you know, immersive experiences, movies, uh, food, somatic experiences, food, alcohol, other somatic experiences that that, that basically shut down that process a little bit. And, and, you know, I I do meditate now, not as much as I should, but I do yoga quite a lot. Um, These were both tools that Rosie introduced me to to help manage kind of my mental health when I was uh, not not brilliantly well traveling can decouple you from the world in a way and I just I decided to not go on the internet for a while and that became like six months and it was a bit scary coming back on Um, but it's good all these things are essentially about you know managing the monkey mind so I wrote a book about attention and then got really interested in attention after the book (laughs) (laughs) because <laughs> I was really interested in advertising and attention was a thematic device I used to pull my ideas for ads together. It was only afterwards, I think, that, yeah, I became really interested in how my attention works and my experience of it and, and how precious it is, I guess. And that's funny because I sort of had these two sides to what I talk about a lot with agencies, especially. I'm like, here's how I think it works and therefore how I think you should think about it is try and engage with it for commercial impact for your brands. At the same time, uh, be respectful because we shouldn't abuse it. It's um, People's attention is their life. It's their experience of their own world, their own reality. And if we take all of it off them, that doesn't feel good to me. You've actually touched on something that I wanted to talk to you about. I mean, you, meant, you mentioned you're 41. I'm 30. And I've seen my my attention in terms of how how it's been taken by the media absolutely battered to pieces how have you found that you've managed to actually stand out in a sea of other people when when attention's becoming so sparse it's a really good question um i think having dreads really helps as a white dude Um, (laughs) (laughs) wait what is it he calls it distinctiveness yeah branding distinctive tropes my wife has pink hair and I have dreads and I'm from England. And so in America, that's pretty good already. Um, it is a really good question because I talk about this a little bit in my book and, and in other things, in that attention is very finite. It's renewable. You get more tomorrow, but you only have as much today as you get, right? You only get to be awake for a certain amount of time. Yeah, of course. And every bit you give up to some advertising person like us trying to absorb it, is some bit less you have to, to live with, basically. Um, so in terms of pattern, like we do a lot of work on or talk a lot about attention as pattern recognition disruption. So basically thinking about how patterns work and then thinking about how you break patterns is how all attention seems to function. Um, it looks for patterns and it ignores them. And as soon as it ignores them, you can then mess with them by breaking them. Um, so that's definitely part of it. But that also leads to an escalation, like an arms race problem. Like because like... Um, grizzly bears and explosions will reliably attract your attention if you push them into someone's face. 
you get this sort of endless, like, it's like being in uh, Times Square. So it's, it's sort of an arms race of shiny, flashy things designed to just get attention because the attention job is so difficult now. And that once you've got it, everyone's like, okay, I'm looking now, what is it? It's like, oh no, that was it. You're like, okay, well, yeah. I don't know about standing out, right? I think that we, one of the things that we've been pretty focused on, I guess, in running our business is running it in a way that we respect and running it how we want things to be run, right? So we pay our vendors and, and our partners within two days. Um, we, we don't take shitty terms from clients. We will not sign shitty contracts. We'd rather walk away. And we have a certain degree of privilege and luxury that allows that, no doubt. But regardless, like um, our values as a business are far more obvious, I think, than, let's say, our products. People often will come to us and say, uh, where do you, um, we, you seem nice. Do you want to, what, what can we do together? I mean, that's a nice brief to get from a client, isn't it, right? They're just like, we, we, just, we just sort of like you, I think, and you seem smart and you know a lot about this stuff. Well, let's, let's find a thing to work on together. That happens probably more often than not. Like probably half the time we get briefs from agencies or people who are like, we, we just, let's find something to work together on. I'm like, okay, cool. That's really, really nice for us because it comes from a place where it's, they're not like you're a really good graphic designer or whatever. They're like, just I think the way you think suits the, the way we need to solve this thing, you know? That's really cool for us. And it shouldn't be so difficult, but it is. Um, we, we, being nice is our number one principle. We have a number of principles, but being nice is number one. Um, and a lot of our clients have become, as I said, good friends of ours. Like we've been on vacation with them. We took our client to Burning Man twice. <laughs> That's that was wonderful. Pretty, That's so it was really cool. fun. Like we just we just like get on with them as people and they like us and then, you know, every two or three or four or five or six or ten years sometimes a project comes up. But you know, one time it literally was the Guardian thing with someone I worked with seventeen years ago. Seventeen years ago, I was like, I remember you, uh, you seem nice, whatever. There's a thing you could probably help us with on this thing. And I was like, What? Because <laughs> that's the kind of, you know, the new business. What's your new business strategy? Being nice for a couple of decades. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that's no. basically that was pretty much it, though. It's like, you know, people don't, people love working with Rosie because she's brilliant. People think that I'm funny, hopefully, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just, it, you know. One of the things I wanted to, to ask you that I'm really interested in, in getting everyone's opinion on is we talk a lot about what we do. Uh, it's easy to promote what we do, but a big part of what you do personally involves at least listening to other people. So if you had to give advice on, on listening to others, what would your number one piece of advice be? It's a great question because Rosie is much, much better at that than I am. I like talking <laughs> and I, like, I love audiences because audiences don't get to say anything. They just get to clap or laugh or not. But so, you know, everyone says this, it's an obvious thing, but like most people don't listen. They just wait for you to stop talking so they can say the thing that they've been thinking about that sounds cool. That's mostly how people talk, I feel like, especially, especially me, I think. Um, and so, uh, and Rosie would say, just listen, listen and see what they say and then see where it goes. I think that's a real skill because when you're talking, time, time is like a highly flexible thing. When you're talking, it could be forever and it's fine. When someone else is talking, one minute goes by and you're like, oh, it's been so long, I don't know <laughs> what to do. I can't even remember what they said to begin with now. And, and that's a really hard thing. Um, it's empathy. I think we sort of shortcut it a little bit. We do cheat because we do so much work with agencies and brands. And then we spent 20 years working in different kinds of agencies and with brands. And so um, it, I guess it's like there's a certain bit of what we do as a consulting project with agencies especially, which is sort of like therapeutic in its application. So lots and lots of interviews with different parts of the agency, trying to work out where the barriers and the, 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 the interesting pieces are, the, the sticky bits. Um, and they're always the same. Like every agency system has very similar conditions and structures, which leads to similar kinds of tribal behaviors and uh, problems, I suppose. So some part of it just comes from uh, sort of knowing, and, and I'm terrible at this, as I said, Rosie's very good at active listening, but I'll just go, oh, it's a bit like when, and then I'll give an anecdote that explains when I had a similar situation that was terrible. And they'll be like, yes. And I was like, yep. Yeah. And so that, I guess, is sort of, um, it's a shortcut from experience. It's perfectly good to, to listen to someone. But if you were giving advice on actually putting what you've heard into action, 
you must have some good advice on on the steps you take in order to put what you what you learn into into something that actually works out positively uh, well so okay it depends on it depends on scale essentially if you want to do something yourself you can just go and do it if you need to work with other people then that's not the case and they need to understand people a bit better so one of the things i used to find very frustrating as a young strategist or consultant i was like here's the most obviously right thing to do please do it and they're like oh it's not gonna it's not gonna work that way i'm like but it's just obviously right right and we all agree it's right so i won't like no a lot of our work since leaving the agency or selling mine was this sounds extremely obvious and trite but i feel like no one does it well and so i will say it um add people in their broadest sense uh, think about human behavior, motivations, and drivers, and try and work out good ways to persuade them to do things for commercial impact, right? That's sort of roughly what it is as an industry. Yeah. Yeah. It occurs to me then that if you just simply take that entire skill set and redirect it to your clients, it's extraordinarily valuable because clients are people that have motivations, incentive systems, structures. And then what we call formal, informal, and conformal objectives and motivations. So humans are in, 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 you know, infinitely complex and wonderful, but you know, there are some things we know that impacts behavior. So humans respond to incentives, let's say. That's a basic thing that economics seems to believe, right? So what do incentives mean in a corporate system? Well, that's a really good question to ask your account director or your client what incentives are structured around this project? And they'll say, here's the brief, here are the objectives. And I say, I'll say, yeah, that's the objectives the company has, but what are your objectives? What you as an individual, as a client, what do you need? What's your bonus based on? Where do you get your status jollies from? What things make you excited? Because if I don't know that, you won't buy any of these ideas I'm trying to sell you. Even if they're the right ideas, that's irrelevant because you're a person with a slightly, slightly informal set of objectives around the formal objectives that the company has given through you. And the same is true of, of every agency, right? There's a, any company with people, creatives and producers and planners and accounting will have different motivations and slightly different typologies. And if you don't appreciate that and like use it to your advantage, it's just gonna be really hard because you're always talking at cross purposes, I think. So it's, people are, yeah, people. And so, yeah, ad people should be really good. Ad people should be the best at this, and I've noticed they're not. And that's why we help agencies do that, because ad people should be extremely good at selling, and they're not. The funniest job I've ever had was teaching people who who had to, to receive phone calls and, and tell other people how to use their mobile phones, how to use those mobile phones. <laughs> And this is ridiculous. These are people who are already working. They had no clue as to how a, to go about actually solving any problems other than what no. was in the paper in front of them. Yeah, And exactly. these are issues that often come about from the strategy right at the start of how of how these people were implemented. And that's it seems ridiculous when you look yeah. at it from from hindsight. But it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's endemically a problem, right? So you write the access script, you write the database script for the call center, or you, let's say, write an algorithm and you've developed a set of coding protocols and normative thresholds based on the data set of your experience, essentially. And so you get things like facial recognition algorithms not being very good at foreign faces, like systemically <laughs> making false positives with black people and Asians because their data set they've been trained on is basically a bit racist. And you're like, it's not intentional, but it's just, it's set at the very beginning. You just didn't think it would be, you know, it didn't occur to you this question could come up. Therefore, it just didn't get built into the system. And therefore, the system cannot answer that question because it's not built in from the beginning. You know, uh, I wanted to, and I, I know I'm going kind of off topic, but I just want your opinion quickly before we, we finish. Um, when we talk about n digital nomads specifically, a name that always comes up, constantly and that I even recommend a lot is Tim Ferriss <laughs> do you have any thoughts about his, his what what he teaches because because I've been thinking about it a lot recently and at the end of the day what he teaches is quite at ends with the actual lifestyle that I live 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Win. You won. I do not work for our yeah. four <laughs> hours a week. I wish I no did. No one does. I, like, no one I'd does. love it as an end goal, but... No one reaches four hours a week, including uh, Tim. Definitely doesn't. <laughs> he he loves working. Loves it. Um, so I don't. I'm not from a position of authority. I can't. I didn't read the four hour work week. It was recommended to me a lot. I think to me, and this is probably unfair. Cause I don't know his podcasts or his endless books and stuff. But he feels like a hustle culture product, and I don't like hustle culture. I just don't think that working is the net good. I think it's not working is the, is, the, is the ideal thing to be doing and that everything we do for work just buys us some more time in our life. Like the, and to loop it back to being a, uh, the nomad thing, right? Uh, we earn a lot less money than we did in New York. We save a lot more and we have so much more time and the time is the thing you don't get back. So I have friends from my, from home, uh, a lot of lawyers and financiers from where I sort of grew up and went to school, lots of lawyers and financiers that have kids and lovely houses and they're making sort of the top dollar you can make in advertising or finance or law, but they have no time, not even at, like, they have like a couple of weeks a year that they'll remember and the rest of it will just be meetings. And I, it sucks, right? Because it shouldn't be a trade-off. It shouldn't just be if you're going to have kids, you have to work all of the time. But like the way it's sort of worked out in our culture is that's essentially what's happened. And my, 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 my best friend is like, I think freedom is just time, isn't it? And I'm like, yep, <laughs> that's literally it. Yeah, You have kids, you get to see them not very often because you have to work to afford their future. But time is the one thing you can't buy, as they say. The actual question I was, I was summing up to with this to end it all off in is if you're selling a nomadic lifestyle to someone how would you sell it realistically what would you sell it as okay so okay well that's a, a tricky thing a i'm not selling it because i think people should what we tend to say now is that we think you should make your life your life's work i don't think being a nomad is the solution for most people i think it's a real pain in the ass for most people they wouldn't enjoy it they just definitely think it, they think it would be great but it's just, it's much more complex than you realize and, and it shouldn't be taken on lightly. It's anyway, that sort of thing. So I think make your life your life's work, which is spend more time thinking about what you like. Now, I, I'm two minds about this because, so the, the Tim Ferriss hustle thing, right? Essentially, it, it treats life like an optimization problem, which is you have a certain amount of things and you have a certain amount of resources. How do you most efficiently channel those resources into getting the things done that you want to achieve? But it's very task focused very like it doesn't allow room for the sort of serendipity of nothing and the kind of important bits of life i think now and and, and partially that's the same problem in, in 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 verse which is that so i think gandhi said this but most gandhi quotes are fake but let's say there's more let's say that this one is <laughs> there's more to life than increasing its speed i think that's one of his fake quotes right and there's a sense that if you could just be more efficient and more productive, then you can finally relax. But once you get on the productivity treadmill, it sort of self-accelerates, right? You could never be produ productive enough. You can never be efficient enough. Never you're, ending. Yeah. You're never perfectly efficient, right? And you can always find new things you could do. And I think our culture needs more time doing nothing than doing more stuff. Even though productivity rates are going down globally, I don't think that's the problem. <laughs> I think I think if we could just spend half an hour a day doing actually nothing, that would be really huge. But I don't see it. There was actually a stat with that about remote workers saying that they ended up working more than people in offices, which was kind of set at set, sold as a as a pro. Like, right. This is great for companies because they work more than people in company. But that's terrible. If you've got someone at home who's working more hours. That's counterproductive, like through and through. Yeah, although it depends what working means, doesn't it? I mean, yes, I agree. Working more hours is bad. We don't need to be working any more hours. We work plenty, I feel like. But I think there's also like there's work and there's working and there's being on email and they all feel they all feel like work. But you could be on email for eight hours a day and have done nothing, and yet you feel like you've done a very busy work day. You know? Absolutely. Or 
conversely, you could be on email all day and you could have arranged all kinds of very complex and ordinarily difficult shit. And, and both those things will feel kind of the same because email always feels the same. If someone can get rid of one, then it, it feels better, you know? But yeah, no, I, I, I think the flexibility means you can move it in both ways, right? If I want to work 24 hours one day and then no time for the rest of the week, as long as I get the stuff done, then it's done. Well, Faris, I have absolutely loved talking to Such you. Such a pleasure. It really has been. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for checking out that episode of the podcast. And I really hope you feel like you learned something from it. I would absolutely love some feedback from you. What should I be doing more of? What should I be doing less of? And what should I change? That would really help me keep the podcast moving forward. And if you enjoyed that episode, a couple more that you might enjoy include the one with Jonathan McDonald. We talk about his book, Powered by Change. We talk about taking accountability and overcoming failure. There's one with Emma Jackson, where we talk about future thinking, ethical business, personal development and self-analysis. And one more I will recommend with Eleanor Snare, where we talk about sustainable business, the value of creativity and mental health in the workplace. Thank you so much for checking out this episode and catch you soon. Yesterday was Monday, and you know what Monday is? It's great. Monday every week is great because I don't have to go to an office and be stressed about whatever stress I was being about. <laughs>